वेलकम गुड इवनिंग इट्स ट्रूली एन ऑनर एंड प्रिवलेज टू शेयर माई थॉट्स विथ यू आई वॉन्ट टू इन पर्टिकुलर थैंक स्वामी जी फॉर गिविंग मी एन अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड ऑल्सो द ऑर्गनाइजर्स हु हैव डन एन इम्पेकेबल जॉब of organizing this conference i had an opportunity this morning to attend some of the sessions and i must say i am humbled by the success stories of the several tech entrepreneurs and i am even more humbled by their sincere desire to give back to the society whether it may be in india or in the us or for that matter in all over the world <clears throat> that trait that desire to give back <clears throat> and help the future generations bodes well for all of us and to tell you the truth deep inside me i have desire to clone all of these successful individuals personally i am not a tech entrepreneur okay. but there is no doubt in my mind that innovation and entrepreneurship are potent forces for economic development robust innovation would easily add a couple percent of economic growth to the nation's development that said i do believe how countries are governed also matters that is what's the role of institutions and we cannot underestimate their importance in the economic growth that we observe all over the world to put things in perspective ask why are north and south korea so different why were east and west germany so different in terms of how they were growing before the berlin wall came crumbling down the quality of governance in a country and the quality of institutions in a country they explain a large fraction of the differences across their economic development the focus of my talk today is to think about what are the institutions in india that are screaming for attention and i will make five points in that respect i'm mindful of the time and i'm also mindful of the fact that i stand between you and di dinner so i will keep my remarks fairly brief you know normally i'm used to giving lectures of hour and half to two hours but today i will <laughs> restrain myself as a professor i won't go on that professorial Uh, track but i will keep it short the first institution that we have to focus is on basic in education <clears throat> one theme during the day that i have listened to from entrepreneurs from india has been that they were nobody before they became somebody I can Mukesh Chatter this morning spoke very eloquently about that. It was education that provided the ladder of opportunity for them and their hard work enabled them to climb that ladder. In other words, education is the weapon of the unarmed. Notwithstanding the tremendous progress India has made and we can take great pride in that. and we have individuals like mohandas pai sitting here and would be speaking next who have been the pillars of that technological revolution that took place in india over the past 30 years but still in spite of all that progress hard numbers if you look at we will find that india has lagged behind all developed nations in literacy and high school education this is not a thing of the past even today that is true okay. 
I recently saw Baji Ram Astani, so that reminded me, if Har Har Mahadev, that was the battle cry of the Marathas, and Swachh Bharat is Modi's mantra, our next chant must be Sus Sushikshit Bharat. <clears throat> Much is made of income inequality. That has been the topic among all economists and all politicians today all across the world. The root cause of income inequality is educational inequality. If the opportunity to be educated is in effect denied for many, income inequality will continue to be a bane of the bane of our society. You might have heard this before. We are only as good as the average quality of the team. Think about cricket or football or baseball, whatever. Can a team succeed competitively if a third of the team is subpar? Same is true of a nation's economic development that would be marred because a large fraction of the society is not trained to succeed in the knowledge economy. Progress on education will require sustained effort. We have to view it as a national priority. It will require intensive participation of all and we will have to harness technology. In other words, we have to fire on all cylinders and recognize that this is a marathon, not a sprint. The second point I want to make is that all of us would recognize that labor and financial capital together are the engines of growth. If you want to make progress, economic development, you need labor as well as capital. Firms like Infosys and TCS, they have grown enormously over the years. And their secret has been through rapid increases in labor capital. That works very well with firms like Infosys or TCS. But there are many other industries for example, education, basic infrastructure, residential and commercial real estate, all of these and many others need huge capital, financial capital, in addition to human capital. India has to be far more welcoming to foreign capital. Entrepreneurs today, they talked about sharing ownership with VCs, that being painful. And I can relate to that, even though I myself am not a, an entrepreneur, as I said, but I do work with many, and I see the pain that they go through when they recognize that 50, 60% of the equity has to be given to the VCs. But that is necessary. It is necessary that we have to swallow that bitter pill. Foreign investment is no different. It's very similar in spirit. Institutions that favor VC investment in a startup, they have much in common with institutions that would channel foreign investment into India. Besides an ownership interest, investment flocks to places where that offer friendly regulation, good law enforcement, decent infrastructure, educated workforce. Government alone can materially improve many of these institutions. Let us commit ourselves to working toward improving all of these institutions. The third point I want to make is about law enforcement and justice. I must applaud Modi government's desire and attention that it is paying to this issue. That said, the problem is really quite serious. Let me give you an example. 
US Supreme Court, it handles less than 150 cases a year. Would you believe the US Supreme Court sits for the whole year and it handles less than 150 cases a year. India's Supreme Court, I was talking to the former Chief Justice of India, Mr. Kapadia, he said 50,000 cases and more. So that, that gives you an indication of, it's good on one hand that they handle so many, but it's bad on the other hand in the sense that anybody and everybody feels that they can go to the Supreme Court for seeking some justice. It really reflects a lack of, lack of confidence in lower courts, the availability of lower courts. What is urgently needed is quality needs to be dramatically upgraded, quantity, number of judges needs to be urgently increased, and the process needs to be dramatically overhauled. Okay. Fourth point, public sector versus private sector. Let me give some stark facts. If you look at all the advanced nations, they have one thing in common, and that is the government's share of industry is not too large. All advanced nations, that is true. Okay. So in every advanced nation, banks, steel mills, coal mines, railways, and many other industries are rarely government owned and operated. They are in the hands of the private sector. Let me couple this with another fact. None of the countries, none of the countries with large government ownership and control of industries is advanced. Okay. So this is in contrast to what is common among all advanced nations that government is not a dominant force of the industry. And every country where government is the dominant force, they are not advanced. So we have to recognize that the path to economic development will never go through the government, and the sooner India sheds control of the industrial and services sector, the faster the economic progress we would achieve. That brings me to the fifth and final point, and that is follow the first four points. Okay, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hespi Kotari.